there is some encouragement in the field of total wrist replacement surgery, and we'll talk about that for a bit. So we'll talk about the history of total wrist replacement, which is a dark history, some advances that have occurred, what the indications are, who a good patient may be for a total wrist replacement, and how these patients do. And uh, lastly, I'll end with the case. So the, the uh, first total wrist replacement was done by a doctor by the name of Gluck here, who you can see over 100 years ago, he used an ivory ball and socket prosthesis uh, for uh, tuberculosis that destroyed a wrist. And as you can imagine, this, this didn't do so great. Um, in 1967, Swanson, who was a pioneer in silicone joint replacements of the upper extremity, uh, developed um, a radiocarpal silicone joint spacer, which was a way, an alternative to just taking out the joint, you had some stability and some motion at the joint. And uh, Swanson spent his career um, really investigating these silicone joint replacements for the wrist, uh, the thumb, and the hand. In uh, 1984, he reported on his series of 181 joint replacements of the wrist. At, uh, for 139 of these patients that he had four-year follow-up, the pain relief was excellent. 90% had complete pain relief. However, many of these did need to be revised. There were 25 revisions. Some of these were converted to wrist fusions. At five years, the results were not as good. Um, only about 50% had uh, pain relief, and there was a 52% implant fracture rate and a 36% revision rate. So these are, most people would agree, unacceptable results. In 1972, Muley, um, surgeon out of Switzerland, developed a new design, which was a metal joint replacement of the wrist. It was a ball and socket design. It wasn't an anatomic design. And, um, Bill Cooney out of the Mayo Clinic reported on a series of this, de uh, this type of design in 140 total wrist replacements. And the results were, were not great again. There was a 33% reoperation rate, almost 10% of these wrists dislocated, and many of these loosened. Another surgeon uh, developed a similar non-anatomic ball and joint design, a um, surgeon by the name of Volz, uh, and this, al this allowed flexion and extension of the wrist, but did not provide normal physiologic motion. There were fewer complications and less incidence of loosening than the prior design. Dr. Beckenbaugh at the Mayo Clinic designed another total wrist replacement that attempted to more closely mimic the normal range of motion of the wrist. This was a biaxial prosthesis. It was semi-constrained, uh, and it had this sort of ovoid uh, surface that you can see here that more closely mimics some of the joints of the, of the wrist. It's important to realize when we're talking about wrist replacement surgery, there are a number of joints between um, the radius, the ulna, and the end of the wrist, the, what we call the distal carpal row. So we're trying to replace multiple joints with one joint, and that's where I think some of the problems arise. But in any case, um, 52 patients of five years had an 82% implant survival rate. So the, the outcomes had been improving. Today, there's really one design that's out that's successful, and there are two implants that mimic this design. Uh, a Remotion is, is the name of one of the implants, and Universal 2 is the name of the other implant. And they both uh, look exactly like this on x-ray. They replace the end of the radius bone, and then the um, what we call the proximal row of the carpus, the scaphoid, lunate, and um, uh, trapezoid. And, uh, or triquetrum, rather. And there's a resurfacing uh, polyethylene um, articulation, much like a total knee, and now we've realized that if we uh, use screws and pegs to better fix these into the distal carpal row, there's less in incidence of loosening. Uh, a series done by uh, Dr. Menon in 1998 reported somewhat better results. There was good pain relief. Still, there was a 14% dislocation rate at nine years, and there was a 5% uh, rate of loose radial components. All of the implants out there in general have more or less the same uh, motion, and um, that motion is important. So uh, the majority, multiple in, uh, investigators have found that the majority of tasks that we all do on a daily basis are uh, accomplished with only about 70% of the normal wrist motion. You need about 40 degrees of wrist flexion and extension and 40 degrees of radial and ulnar deviation to, to do most tasks. Uh, most important, however, is extension and ulnar deviation, where we get our power grip from. 
So what are the indications today for total wrist arthroplasty? I think they are still fairly limited, but there are a number of patients who can benefit from this surgery. Uh, uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis, again, do quite well, the lower demand patients. Patients with post-traumatic arthritis um, can do well, lower uh, demand, more elderly patients in that group, as well as patients with traditional osteoarthritis or patients who have not tolerated or who have failed a wrist fusion. And to me, the ideal patient is someone with arthritis that's painful, but has good alignment, good motion, is not a manual laborer, and is somewhat older, that really wants to preserve wrist range of motion. And especially a patient who may have had a fusion on the other side, which uh, can be twi quite debilitating, as Dr. Uh, Crow referred to, to have fusions on both sides. So who would we never consider doing a wrist replacement on? Patients with prior infection. patients that don't have sufficient bone to accept the implants. Patients, again, that have lack of neurologic or control or motor function. Patients that are severely stiff to the point where we worry about the implants dislocating. And then patients uh, with rheumatoid disease who don't have function of all the tendons. And uh, as with any of the upper extremity uh, joint replacements from the elbow down, patients who really need to weight bear are not good candidates for these, uh, these surgeries. So these are some complications, as Dr. Crow alluded to. Intraoperatively, there are some bad complications, including fractures of the radius um, or the carpus. Here you can see a horrendous looking x-ray of a, an implant that's going through the carpus and through the metacarpals. Tendon lacerations can occur. These, I would argue that these complications we've gotten better at avoiding. Early complications also occur, including stiffness, imbalance of the wrist and disease of one of the adjacent joints called the distal radial ulnar joint. And these, these complications can be managed as well. What we've really focused on uh, managing is the long-term complications, which are related in part to the implant design and in part to the uh, patient selection. And these include dislocation of the implants, implant loosening, and um, problems related to tendon irritation and infection. So the gold standard, is, as Dr. Crow mentioned, for symptomatic painful wrist disease is wrist fusion. We can do complete wrist fusion, total wrist fusion, or we can fuse some of the joints. And this is still the gold standard in a manual laborer. This has very predictable and good, uh, good long-term functional results at the cost of losing motion in the wrist. Um, so for instance, Cobus and Turner reported 97% good to excellent results at six years in a series of 87 patients. It's hard to beat that with wrist replacement. However, fusions have their own complications. Some of them don't heal, they develop non-unions. Fractures can occur, hardware from the implants can irritate uh, adjacent tendons and uh, wounds can be an issue. Uh, Murphy in 2003 compared the functional outcomes in 51 patients that had either a total wrist replacement with the modern implants versus a total wrist fusion. The replacement group had trends towards better performance, better ability for personal hygiene, and better ability to fasten buttons. And then the fusion group um, had a higher incidence uh, than the replacement group in limitations in daily activities. A um, guy by the name of Kevin Chung out of the University of Michigan who has done a tremendous amount of cost-effectiveness out outcomes research in the hand and upper extremity showed that total wrist replacement is as uh, cost-effective as wrist fusion, and they're both very cost-effective options. And then some other investigators have found that patients who have had a wrist fusion on one wrist and a wrist replacement on the other wrist tend to prefer the wrist replacement. So what are the outcomes of modern implants? Again, it's a mixed bag of results. Uh, Solomon and colleagues in 2007 reported the results of a multi-center prospective study, very well done study in almost 60 uh, wrists, treated with one of the uh, modern total wrist replacements. At short-term results, there were no complications, 95% had decreased pain, and functional reports were improved. This was uh, very short-term results. Bill Cooney at the Mayo Clinic in 2007 followed another group of 27 patients with both RA and post-traumatic disease. And again, at short-term, there was uh, a good and encouraging result. Uh, only one patient had a minor tendonitis, mean range of motion was excellent, and the functional outcomes were quite good. Recently in 2011, another group out of the University of Iowa um, 
examined another 24 uh, patients with rheumatoid disease and found that the results weren't as encouraging when we looked at um, later um, outcomes at seven, seven years plus. So while functional uh, results improved and range of motion was quite good, 50% of these risks required a revision at some time in the study period. Um, and this was for a variety of reasons, in including loose components, instability, and subsidence of the components. And here you can see again um, uh, what we call a Kaplan-Meier survival curve, showing decreasing survival of the implant with time. And again, our hip and knee colleagues would never put in an implant that had 50% uh, survival at uh, seven years. However, as uh, Dr. Crow alluded to, there is some encouraging uh, recent uh, results, and I think with guarded optimism, uh, hand and wrist surgeons are, are beginning to consider this as an option in the selected patient. So uh, a group in Europe in 2011 reported on 21 consecutive patients uh, treated with, again, this, this modern implant, the universal total wrist replacement, at five and a half years and found really quite good results. Post-op functional risk scores uh, were very high. Most patients were satisfied. There were minimal complications, just some uh, superficial wound uh, problems, and there were three late complications in this group of 21 patients. There were no revisions or dislocations in this group. So this led to some uh, um, increased attention, and there's uh, some differences in the technique that these um, investigators used, including fusing the distal row of bones here, which may have led to increasing success. And again, the study that Dr. Crow referred to by Dr. Herzberg and Becksteins, which was presented at our Hand Society meeting this year, looked at a uh, multi-center prospective study of 215 cases and again found really encouraging results. The uh, pain was reliably reduced, functional results were good. The flexion and extension range of motion was excellent. Patients with rheumatoid disease and non-rheumatoid disease did nearly equally well. And the survival rate was in a range where finally our hip and knee colleagues would uh, would wake up and consider something like this. That there was a 92% survival rate of four years, which is um, quite acceptable. So here's a case presentation. This was a seven-year-old right-hand dominant uh, woman that had long-standing left wrist pain. It didn't respond to conservative management. She had injections, she had en um, other treatments, and really wanted to do something about this. To this patient, wrist fusion was not acceptable. She was a lower demand elderly patient. Her exam revealed that she had painful range of motion, but she ha did have some preserved motion, and uh, she uh, was a candidate for wrist replacement surgery. Here, her x-rays show what we call advanced slack arthritis, or a type of arthritis related to ligament damage in the wrist, and most of the joints in the wrist are damaged here. This is a patient for which we may consider a partial or total wrist fusion, and they can do quite well, but this is also potentially the ideal um, candidate for a total wrist replacement. So I, I know no one's uh, eaten lunch yet, and at the uh, risk of showing some gory pictures, I'll go through this quickly, but th this was um, a standard dorsal approach to the uh, wrist that was performed. We exposed the wrist. Again, you can see here um, arthri arthritis not only on the x-rays, but here actually in vivo, you see no cartilage there at the ends of the radiocarpal joint. Standard jigs for the device are used to cut out the arthritic joints, including in the proximal carpal row and also in the distal radius. The distal radius is prepared to accept a stem for the implant, and the same thing in the distal carpal row. We're putting in the implant, which it has pegs and screws to, uh, to be fixed to the, the carpus and the hand. And then a trial component is placed. The patient is taken through a range of motion. These were her uh, immediate intra fluoroscopy pictures, and here's sort of an interesting picture. During surgery, we're using fluoroscopy to document her range of motion, and here you can see um, an impressive range of motion, which you would not get in a fusion operation. This is ulnar and radial deviation, and here is flexion and extension that's afforded by the implant. So in summary, um, total wrist replacement is not for all of our patients. There's a very limited subset of patients who may benefit from this surgery, but the benefits include preserving a functional range of motion about the wrist and very reliable pain relief. 
It can always be revised to a fusion, although with somewhat more difficulty. Historically, it does have a high complication revision rate, and again, we can't place it in a high demand patient or a manual laborer. The future, I think, is going to show that evolving implant design improve, improved survival of implants and lower rate of complications in recent studies offers some promise, and I think we may have some expanding indications in a limited subset of patients. Thank you.